everyone. Did we have a good time last night at the town hall and at the hip hop party? Yes, we did. Uh, you should see yourselves on uh, on social media. That performance from Elias. Did y'all see him get down and do the pinwheel? Uh, what is it called? Hip helicopter? Helicopter. Thank you. Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And so we have a lot to pack into a short period of time. Uh, we are going to actually have our south and east reports immediately following the toolkit. But let's get into this toolkit. Uh, this work is not done alone. It is done with many partners, many experts, uh, many people, scholars, and so on. And so what we do at the end of each of our symposiums is we bring up those practitioners, those technical assistance providers, those leaders that support us in our work. They have supported Evanston and they have supported uh, most of us here today. And so if you don't know who to call on for legal frameworks or for developing your harm report um, or for any type of reports, research, and so on, education, um, you will have that information and that contact today. Please do follow up with these leaders uh, after the symposium and get what you need to get your initiative moving forward. And we're going to open up with our, our queen sister. She's not up here, but I'm sure she's in the room, Nikichi Taifa. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perfect. So um, I would say that um, Sister Attorney Nikichi Taifa is our spokeswoman. She is our cheerleader. She is our advocate. She is our leader. She is Queen Warrior Reparations on Fire. Yes, she is. And she is going to give us our first presentation as the founder and director of Reparations Education Project. And then we'd be here until next week if I told you every other role and title that she has currently and has had in the past. Um, but I will lift up a founding member of uh, NARC and a founding member of Encobra as two legacy orgs. All right, so I want everybody on this side of the room to say, agitate. Let me hear you. Agitate. This side, educate. educate. That side, organize. organize. Again, agitate. Educate. 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 Organize. organize. How are we going to make reparations rise? Agitate. Educate. Organize. How are we going to make reparations rise? Agitate. Educate. Organize. My name? <laughs> Hi, it's Nikichi uh, Taifa. How many of you here have seen my TED talk, TEDx talk, uh, reparations and issues, time has come? Uh, what about the transcript to it? It's in here. Um, because TED said, where, 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 where's your sources? They didn't believe some of the stuff I was saying, like, you know, crime against humanity and all like that. So I went and published the uh, transcript of my TED talk with sources, with receipts, like they say, young people say, I got receipts. I, uh, what else? What else do I have? Um, oh, I, I don't know how many of y'all, I'm just not going to say have read, I'll just say have, because most of the time I find folk who buy books don't always read them, but my book's Reparation on Fire, How and Why It's Spreading Across America. This is the last one left, and two people said they wanted it, I don't remember who they are now, but I don't want to go back with it. Okay, there was a hand over there. Uh, yeah, and also my memoir, this is just a brochure from it because it came out during COVID and had all these pre-ordered brochures but nowhere to go because it was, so Black Power, Black Lawyer, My Audacious Quest for Justice. Okay, so anyway. Uh, so again, how are we going to make reparations rise, agitate, educate, organize. So I am the executive director of the, I'll sit down, Reparation Education Project. And our mission is number two, to educate, okay? Reparation Education Project is not a grassroots um, membership organization. The movement has in COBRA for that, okay? Reparation Education Project is not a commission. The movement has NARC for that. Reparation Education Project is not a hub for state and local reparations initiatives. The movement has first repair for that. <laughs> 
The Reparation Education Project does not seek to unify organizations. The movement has reparations united for that. Reparation Education Project is not a legal organization. The movement has the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights uh, Center and the African American Redress Network for that. Reparation Education Project is not expert in countering cultural disinformation. The movement has the National Black Cultural Information Trust for that. And the Reparation Education Project does not grant money. <laughs> the movement has liberation ventures, amongst others, for that. But what the Reparation Education Project does best is to support and amplify the escalating reparations ecosystem as a trusted resource and strategic thought partner, bringing to the table longstanding expertise and demonstrated capacity for effective cross-sector collaboration. We specialize in presentations, trainings, strategic planning, and guidance on reparations to nonprofit organizations, academic and faith institutions, descendant advocacy communities, corporations and industries, celebrity influencers, private estates, and philanthropy. But most importantly, we really kind of serve as an onboarding ramp for newcomers to the field through our lively and interactive Reparations Movement Monthly Meetup, RMMM. Raise your hand if you're at all familiar with RMMM. Anybody here? OK. So we meet the lab virtually the last Tuesday of uh, each month as a virtual safe space open to everyone that provides the opportunity for organizations and individuals that are part of the reparations movement or interested in learning more about it to come together for networking, for collaboration, for education, for information sharing on issues relative um, to the um, rapidly growing reparations uh, movement. Uh, so again, let me see the hands of anybody who has been participating in at least one of the RMMMs over the past year. Okay. Again, it's an excellent space for newcomers, organizations, institutions, send your newcomers to RMMM. We're not an organization, so we're not trying to take your members, okay? Um, and what we really want is for organized entities to send a representative yourself so that you can engage in the chat with these newcomers. Let them know what you're doing, what your information is, what your events are, what your upcoming things are. Because this really is a space for people to put names to faces and find out what's going on in other parts of the movement that they can plug into and be a, um, a part of. And it lasts only an hour. So the Reparation Education Project also co-hosts, along with the National Black Cultural um, Information Trust, the Reparation Information Thought Series, a periodic strategic webinar featuring racial justice thought leaders engaged in critical discussion reflection, and analysis on issues pertinent to the movement for reparatory justice in the US and abroad. And in fact, our very next thought series uh, which will be this Tuesday, December 5th, features none other than a fireside chat with our fearless leader, Robin Ruth Simmons, whom brother, ancestor, Conrad Warriel has pegged as the Rosa Parks of the reparations movement. And just interestingly, just yesterday, December 1st, 1955, was the date that Rosa Parks sat down on that bus and spurred a whole movement. That really has changed the landscape um, uh, uh, you know, of this country. Uh, and likewise, I dare say that Robin Ruth Simmons has sparked the proliferation of local and state reparations initiatives around the country, Amherst, Boston, Tulsa, St. Louis, Asheville, Detroit, Kansas, Greenbelt, uh, Fulton County, Lakeland, y'all Washington, DC, what if I miss, call it out, did I miss any uh, places? But, Oh, say it again, say it loud. St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul, Minnesota. Greenbelt, Maryland. Greenbelt, I think I said Greenbelt. If I didn't, Atlanta, it was on here. Atlanta, Atlanta was on here too. <laughs> yeah, all of the, all of the above. And so, so, so uh, more. So as I'm getting ready to come um, to a close, I just want to say we also provide technical assistance uh, upon request, get you out of the lobby, um, I think, uh, to federal, state, and local legislative bodies advocating the signing of an executive order bringing HR 40 immediately into existence uh, through our consulting firm, the Taifa Group. 
So in closing, what I want to do is just pose a couple of questions um, to you from the Reparation Education Projects Reparations Trivia Fun Quiz uh, that we um, um, do as part of our RMMM the last Tuesday of each month. So if you know the answer, raise your hand and Shakira is going to um, Shakira got it. <laughs> it's going to give you a little, a gift. We also have uh, a merchandise messaging campaign of which I put all the things that fit into my carry-on suitcase, but we have much more than that. So which, which two, listen, which two formerly incarcerated, oh, see, incarcerated and enslaved, you know, 40 and slip is the same thing. I meant to say which what two formerly enslaved black women filed and won reparation lawsuits before the 20th century? What two formerly enslaved women, okay, filed and won reparations lawsuits before the 20th century? Who thinks they know the name of one of them at least? I saw a hand right there, my sister, stand up. Do you know what, all, both of them? You got to know both to get this little something, something. <laughs> well, let me hear one of them. What women, who thinks they know both? Right here. Who, who do it? All oh, right. Oh, Jim, okay, okay. I know you know. Come on, brother. Well, hold on. Let me see if there's someone else. For, see, brother Jamoke has been in, in, in the decades, has been a reparation list. Anybody else? Should we go with Jamoke? Yeah. Let's let the sister right there. Let's let her give her one, see if she got that right. Belinda Sutton Royal was one of them. Let's give her a hand. Belinda Sutton Royal, absolutely. Massachusetts legislature. Yeah, you're going to give it. We, we're going to, you give the other one. Who's the other one? And Henrietta Wood. Look them up. Or the information is on Reparation Education Project's website. You can look that up. But hold up. What did she get? A, a, a little, hold it up. It's a little notebook, Reparations Now. Okay, next question, and we're coming to a question. <laughs> um, name the activists. Okay, I hope these aren't too difficult. But see, you know what? We need this information. This is our reparationist history. Okay, listen. Name the activists. And y'all, we've gone over some of these in the RMMs. But anyway, name the activists who were sentenced in 1917 to prison for a year and a day for her work fighting for pensions, what we call reparations today, for the formerly enslaved. It was an activist, a black woman, who was sentenced in the year 1917, I know you know Kenneth, to prison for a year and a day. I mean, this is our history, and we need to know this. Who was sentenced to prison, served a year and a day for her reparations work because the government said she was committing fraud because no way could she have believed that the U.S. government would actually pay reparations, so they put her in prison? Who thinks they, anybody other than Kenneth knows that? I see a hand over, Billy, AK, okay, we all know. <laughs> Billy, who, who's the answer, do you know? Callie House. Callie House and Isaiah Dickinson um, formed the, was the first mass-based reparations movement, had over 600,000 members back in the late 1800s, and she went to prison. She was a washerwoman going all around the country saying, you need to pay up, okay? She was thrown in prison. Callie House, look her up. Um, just two more. What, is the, what did she get? What did she hold up? Oh, that's a little jewelry bag. Reparations now. Gotcha. What is the name of the black man from Detroit who constantly appealed to Congressman John Conyers to introduce a reparations bill in Congress? We're talking about the name of the black man in Detroit who, <laughs> who constantly appealed to Congressman John Conyers to introduce a reparations bill. I thought I saw her hand. He took my answer. Did he say it already? Reparations Ray. Reparations Ray what? You got it. Let's go ahead. <laughs> reparations, Ray Jenkins. This is our reparations history. And the last question, what did you got? Ask her which one she wants. Okay, that's a larger bag or whatever. And finally, last question, what is the name of the state? This is current news right now. 
What is the name of the state that just introduced an atrocious bill to prohibit reparation payments? The name of the state. Florida, where you live? Let's give it up. Let's get. Say that again. We need more than what. Well, so. So these gifts are part of reparation education projects, and that is a. Hold that up. That's my favorite one. It's a reusable shopping bag. It holds a lot of stuff, all your groceries, and everyone show your love uh, for uh, reparations. So I just want to say in conclusion, reparations indeed is an issue whose time has come, but it won't be actualized um, until the issue becomes much, much more visible in the mainstream. And one of the ways is like t-shirts, the first um, repair hats, so reparations love uh, t-shirts. Um, I can't give you this because I drank out of it. Uh, but, but water bottles, coffee mugs, lawn signs, all of those are on our website. But make your own and put your own QR code on it and make it like Black Lives Matter. Everywhere you go, there was a Black Lives Matter sign on church um, lawns and all like that. Reparations, an issue as time has come in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Nikichi. Um, let's do this for the sake of time. If you all could popcorn it to each other, the panelists on the stage, um, just so that, because you know I'm long-winded, and I'm going to be loving each one of y'all and all that and take up so much time. It's hot. Perfect. And so if, if, once you have um, presented, if you could take your seat in the classroom, and then we could have others come up, like Trevor and Vickas, if you'd like. Thank you. Professor Guy Mount. Hello, family. Hello. Greetings. Greetings. Um, so I was asked to talk about harm reports. Um, and I'd like to open by saying there are many ways you can do harm reports. Um, I'll give a couple perspectives and a couple of ideas. Um, the one that I was part of doing initially um, was at the University of Chicago, where we uncovered the university's historical ties to slavery. So I was the kind of lead co-author on that uh, report. Um, but I'd like to first take a step back and um, lift up something that um, Brother Cam taught me about kind of where we're all at as a, as a movement right now. Um, and we've kind of gotten away from this. Um, we don't need to make the case for reparations anymore. Um, I tell my students black history itself makes the case for reparations. We're reparations enforcers, according to Brother Cam. We're enforcing reparations. And we're de making the demands, extending the demands that the ancestors made, as Sister Nkishi is telling us, right, all throughout this history of, of, of black peoples in this country. The demand for reparations is part and parcel of black history. And if you think about the role that a case, Ta-Nehisi's piece, ta Coates' piece, The Case for Reparations made. That wasn't the first time the case was made, of course, right? ta effectively synthesized these generational struggles and basically allowed us, opened us up to not have to make the case anymore, right? That case had been made, and Cobra had been making that case, Queen Mother Moore had been making that case, Kaylee House had been making that case, Belinda Sutton had been making that case. It's been made. So the harm report is not us making the case for reparations anymore. We don't have to do that. When I teach my reparations courses, I tell my students, we're not going to debate the merits of reparations anymore. We don't have to. That is done. If you have read any, one, read 300 pages of black history, one black history book, and if you don't come away with saying reparations are due, something's wrong with you. <laughs> So we don't need to make the case. That's not what a harm report, in my opinion, should be, though many times we, we think of it that way, right? And I've been trying to think about why we think of it um, that way. And I think one of the reasons we think of it that way is because we think that the way change has happened for black peoples in this country has been we make the case, we have the moral argument, we have the right cause, and a certain critical mass of white peoples 
have a come to Jesus moment, realize the errors of their ways, repent, and change policy. That we do the activist work, we educate, we organize, we do all that, and all of a sudden white America is going to have a come to Jesus moment, and the powers that be will concede. That's also not how black history has worked, right? I would point to two moments in American history in which some kind of change has happened. And this is, of course, emancipation, and this is the civil rights movement. 10% of white Americans believed ending slavery was the right thing to do circa 1865. So all that abolitionist work, all that organizing, transnational movement to convince white America that slavery was wrong, it moved 10% of white America. So that's not why, we, we should not tell the story that this is how we got to emancipation, right? What did happen is black people took up arms. Black people ran off of plantations. Black peoples refused to work. They went on strike. Now, I don't know about the, I, I don't think that context is here again. I don't think armed struggles in the cards right now. I don't think that's gonna play now, but that's how it happened. Enslaved peoples freed themselves. Lincoln did not free the slaves. So that's one model of change, actual model of change, that we mystify by saying it was a pressure campaign and white America came to Jesus and all that. So white America didn't come to Jesus then. Fast forward civil rights movement, right? We also tell this story, right? All the activists, which had to happen, all that activist work had to happen. But that activist work in the 1950s and 60s, T. Thomas Fortune had been doing that work since the 1880s. There were 70 years of test cases and sit-ins and marches and protests before, let's say, 1955, which is, uh, let's say, Brown versus the Board of Education as a starting point and a mark. Why did Brown versus the Board of Education happen? Why did the Civil Rights Acts happen? What did the people who pushed the button on that say? When Martin Luther King died, he did not have 50% approval ratings among black America. White America was like something like 30% of white America approved of the job that Martin Luther King Jr. was doing. So the idea that he changed hearts and minds was not it. What he did is he provided the pressure and he told the truth. And that's what a harm report is. It's the telling of the truth. The way it happened in the civil rights movement and if you look at the archives of the uh, Supreme Court justices who voted unanimously to end, um, the Brown versus the Board of Education ended the period of segregation, you look at their archives, you look at the swing voters in Congress who voted to uh, Civil Voting Rights Act, um, all of that, it was the Cold War. The Soviet Union had been making incredible propaganda by telling the truth about American racism all over the world, shaming America by saying, this is what you are doing to black peoples. This is what capitalism does. And they convinced people in Asia, people in Latin America, people in um, Africa, don't be part of the ca racial capitalist system of America because this is what they're doing to black peoples. And if you look in the archives, this is what the politicians, the Supreme Court justices were looking at, that international pressure forced them to make, rep, make uh, the civil rights movement happen legislatively because they had the pressure from activists in the US, they had the international geopolitics pushing them, they didn't have a come to Jesus moment then. Their constituents were not behind civil rights. If you look at interracial marriage as a, as a marker, right, when that was made legal, it was something like 20% of white America again is thinking this is okay. So the action happens first and the, the people come along later, and you saw this in Evanston, the data in Evanston. I don't know if we have polling before Evanston happened, but it wasn't that white America had to come to Jesus moment in Evanston and then reparations happened. It's Robin did the work, the whole community made the demand, and Evanston is in this place where we don't want to appear racist, so what's the best way to do it? We will make reparations. <laughs> so we have to know, and this is what Cam is so brilliantly telling us to do as it relates to kind of national politics, right, is realize how the systems of power work and kind of move strategically. And I give this example globally. So I know we're doing local stuff. I would say the harm reports are a way to honor the ancestors, a way for the ancestors to speak 
a way to tell the truth about what happened, but that's not going to be sufficient to create a come to Jesus moment. We're going to have to think strategically about ways in which we can take those harm reports, that truth, and make it work in a way that the powers that be are going to do things. So here's the example I give, and just contemplate this for a moment. So now we're in our local movements. We're doing our harm reports. We want reparations locally. We want reparations nationally. We want reparations internationally. Imagine a world, and I'm actually consulting right now with an unknown, well, uh, unspoken presidential candidate in an African nation, let's say. So he's running for president in Africa. I'm kind of his reparations consultant right now. And what I'm telling him, and what I'm telling you, and what I think could get us there. Imagine a world in which that, say he wins, say he's in power, and part of his platform is, we're turning away from the West. The West has done, the West has done slavery to us. The West has done colonialism to us. And we are no longer doing business with the West. We're turning to China. We're not doing business with America anymore. That, he's already going to do that. So I'm telling him, hey, tell the world that you're not going to do business with the US anymore until they do reparations. And now imagine if other African nations do a similar boycott, right? We're talking boycott um, uh, Israeli products, which we should be doing. How about boycott American products, right? Boycott all of Africa, boycotts American products. American consultants, American, and says we're going to work with China, Latin America, this new pan third world alliance, and says we're not going to do anything until America does reparations. And then China steps up and says, we're going to do reparations because we want to be the big moral, like, uh, uh, whereas America's doing it wrong, so we'll step in and provide aid to Africa and aid to African Americans. Imagine China offering reparations to African Americans. Imagine us trying to make that go. So these are the kind of geopolitical things. And by the way, I'm not just kind of talking here. If you want a reference on this, this is Gerald Horn's article um, in, a, in a book. It's a compilation called Repair. So Gerald Horn co contemplated this back in like the 70s. And he said, look, locally, nationally, globally, if we want to get to reparations, we've got to keep the geopolitical in mind. And we've got to do the stuff that Cam is talking about as it relates to telling Biden, hey, if you don't do reparations, you might not get the black vote. That's how you use power, right? That's how you make stuff go. And so we've got to keep doing our activist work. We've got to keep telling the truth. But that's a moral, ethical thing for us to do. Um, what makes things change are powers beyond us that we have to start thinking about and start trying to, to influence. So harm reports, write them, do them, reach out to your academics. If you need help reaching out to academics in your community, let me know. Um, I'll say this. I said it last time. But I've been telling, talking to Brother Keith about this. I'll repeat this quote academics that you might work with to do the harm report. This comes from Walter Rodney, um, who wrote a book called um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and everybody should read this book, because um, Africa needs reparations too, by the way. We haven't said that, and I think we should say that. Um, Walter Rodney said of academics that you might be working with, he cautioned you. And he said, academics are, quote, the enemies of the people until proven otherwise. I said that as an academic, he said that as an academic. We are, what institutions, what universities do is they're going to take your movement, and many of you I've talked to have, have experienced this, they will take your movement, they will water it down to oblivion, they'll try to make it discernible, and you're going to be left with it not in the control of the community. The people that most need reparations need to be in control of that process. Don't hand it off to academics. You, the, the movements on the ground, all these local movements need to be in control of the process and know that that academic has to prove to you that they are not the enemy of the people because otherwise their default setting is going to be to absorb, water down, distill, and destroy this movement rather than help it. So I hope I can prove it and do whatever I can. I'll help you guys however um, I can. But um, yeah, write those harm reports if you need help with them. My only technical advice, it's not even advice, it's a mandate. I tell all my students this. Um, there's only one style of footnote to use. Um, it's Chicago style. I don't know if what they are, but <laughs> there's Chicago style footnotes. And then there's a bunch of like, like imposters that like the Chicago style footnote is the only footnote um, and there's a whole manual on it you can google it I'll happy anything else is it's like a treasure hunt these other things it doesn't make 
please use Chicago style footnotes if you want you know, people to hear it and say, oh, it's, it's cited well, it's well cited and things. So anyway, um, appreciate y'all. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Ann Mitchell Iwuyor, founder of the National Black Cultural Information Trust. We share news, information, and resources that uplifts the collective freedom of black communities. So a little bit about me. Um, I come from probably five, six generations of preachers and a whole lot of people in the black Southern church across the South Georgia and South Carolina. I'm showing you a, uh, one of the oldest pictures that I have of one of my ancestors, that's Bishop Benjamin Jones, my great great grandfather who was born during slavery. Then that's his son, Reverend Benny Jones, uh, my great grandfather, and then that's me and my granddaddy, Ernest Jones Sr., just to show context to how far, how not so far away we are from enslavement. And in this photo, I am the child, and um, I'm in there right next to my great-grandmama Flossie that escaped off of a plantation in Warren, Georgia, and that's her daughter next to her, my grandma Virginia, who was a child when they escaped, and my mama holding me up in front of our family church, um, Wesley Chapel AME in Augusta, Georgia. So I, I put that there to really put a focus on um, why I do the work that I do. I've always had an interest in my personal family history and also African American studies. So I went on to get a master's in Pan-African studies from Syracuse University and a master of science in public relations also from Syracuse University to fuse the two fields so that we can communicate what it is that we need for our communities and our internal um, struggles within the movement. So what I'm talking about today is communications for local reparations. And I can, again, send you directly this PDF if you need it. First, you, you may have began, you, you may have um, already been in the throes of your uh, reparations movements your reparations task forces. Um, but this should be done before that even happens, but if you already started, it's okay. You can still sit down and create a communications plan. So you want to first get a communications point person or a firm uh, for managing, strategizing, developing communications needs, and try to get this included in your budget if you do, if you do have a budget. If you don't have a budget, there's ways to get around that. You can still develop a plan with people from within your organization. The communications plan should include uh, a plan for community outreach, determining best methods for reaching the public and your specific community, a media relations strategy, developing a plan to build connections with local journalists to gain coverage for your story, press releases, who's going to write them, publish them, distribute them, and there is a science behind it. There's a science behind getting and amplifying that publicity. Announcements, you want to make sure it covers launches, any big news, including quotes from your task force members and other folks working on your initiative. You want to have fact sheets, fact sheets that cover the top line issues that pertain to your reparations task force, including your talking points and, free, and answer frequently asked questions. Additional communications needs includes a media scan. That's sitting down and going over what the media is currently talking about with um, whatever initiative that you're working on. Then you also want to have a plan for writing op-eds and submitting those to the local newspapers. And if you don't have time for an op-ed and getting that approved, you can do a, a shorter version of that, which is a letter to the editor where they write an article about reparations and you want to correct something or you want to emphasize something, letters to the editor can be as short as two paragraphs. And they usually publish them by anybody that sends it to the local media. So there's also a plan you want to have for paid media and earned media. Paid media is radio, billboards, email newsletters, your website, social media ad buying, press releases, because sometimes you have to pay for them to be distributed or uh, you have to pay for somebody to write them if you don't have a communications team. Earned media is free, but like the, the name says, it's earned, 
okay? So there's interviews with journalists, there's stories that are developed about your task force based on press releases that were distributed, and stories based on what was discussed at task force hearings. So when you have your different local initiatives, there'll be reporters there, hopefully they write about it, hopefully they include the information that you want included. Then you wanna have a messaging strategy that's a part of the overall plan. The messaging strategy is where you develop specific messages that you want your specific audiences to understand and remember. And generally, when people think about communications, they just think, everybody. I just want to go to everybody. But no, there's targeted audiences, and there's different things that you want those audience to, audiences to know. So if you need to convince your governor of something, that's a specific audience that you need to create a specific plan to write something out to persuade or get the governor or whatever legal, um, whatever uh, governmental entity on board. Then you have a message for your local black community to get the, the community educated on board and attending meetings. You wanna have a message for journalists because journalists will be writing these stories and then you wanna have a specific message for them to understand what you're working on. So these are some of the questions you may wanna answer in your messaging strategy. What's the story behind your reparations task force? What are reparations? Why are we old reparations? How can reparations be implemented? Controlling the narrative and correcting media misinformation. And there's going to be a lot of it. There's currently a right-wing attack on reparations. There always has been. And there, to be honest, there's a liberal attack on it too. <laughs> But it's just much more surreptitious. So, but in anti-reparations messaging, this is often what is at the forefront of right-wing media. Black Americans are trying to get money for harms we didn't experience. You weren't a slave. They're making innocent white Americans pay for harms they didn't commit. I never owned slaves. They want ridiculous amounts of money focusing on cash payments. And just so that you know how far this goes, there are currently running paid advertisements, if right now as we speak, for when people write in why reparations are needed, what comes up? The idea for reparations for slavery is morally appealing but flawed. And then when you click on it, it, and okay, there's another one. The economics of reparations. And you see that small sponsored word, like if you can see it, I know it's tiny. It's very small, but it says sponsored. They're paying for these ads right now on uh, Google ads across YouTube, Google, wherever. And when you click on it, it goes to The Economist, and then they have these articles basically with their own messaging to try to uh, dispel what we're working on in the reparations movement. It's very important um, to really understand how the messaging is meant to work. It's not meant to just dissuade white Americans from not doing it. It's also meant to make us feel like the fight isn't worth it. So just to continue on, another strategy is that right-wing media will attend local reparations task force meetings and initiatives with the express purpose of delegitimizing the movement that will nitpick little things. So I, I'm, let me see if I can, I don't wanna mess this up, Lord. Let's see if I can scroll down so you can really see the picture. Yes, 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 I can do it. Okay, so this is from Fox News. They were all over California reparations task force. They had the camera set up right in the middle. They were ready. They were just, they were in there, okay? And so when anything happened that could be twisted or misconstrued as, as outlandish, that's what they did. They would, they would pick those pieces. So this one, look at the headline. Activists demand higher payments from California reparations task force, 200 million per person. <laughs> now y'all know. And that is again meant to make not just white Americans, but black Americans go, oh, they're getting ridiculous now. We ain't gonna get nothing. I can't, I don't know if I wanna be a part of that. 
So, but what, you know, isn't explained here is, you know, at these meetings, people do have all kinds of feelings and we listen to everybody in the community. But y'all know that this person is not on the task force, but they make it appear as if this is a real plan that people are moving forward with. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at the different antics. So the anti-reparations messaging strategy is to make reparations appear absurd, make slavery seem like a long time ago, disconnect slavery from modern day systemic racism and our current experiences, frame the reparations movement as unfair to innocent Americans. And again, they use this angle. So one of the articles that came out during the California task force was um, written by a Republican Asian American on why she doesn't, her taxes shouldn't go to reparations and trying to do this whole framing of immigrant versus black American to sow that the negative sentiments between the various communities. And then another messaging strategy, as I mentioned earlier, focus on money and big numbers. The pro-reparation strategy, we do the opposite. We make reparations appear necessary, because it is. We tell stories and showcase personal narratives of living African Americans that were born on plantations, experienced Jim Crow, and share stories from their descendants, like I started out with. Again, this isn't for convincing necessarily white America, but for reminding ourselves and our own community of the harms that we're experiencing and how they're not disconnected from enslavement and how far away that, that not really, it, it really isn't that far away as a lot of us are conceiving. We emphasize slavery was not that long ago. Many African Americans are just one or two generations removed from slavery or Jim Crow. Connect the dots between the three errors of harm chattel slavery, Jim Crow, modern day systemic racism. And we, we talk about like, why are we in the housing crisis? Oh, this is a vestige of slavery and Jim Crow. Here's how black Americans were denied human rights, housing, GI Bill benefits um, by the US government. How do we fix it? Reparations. And we, again, emphasize it's more than about money. We must also uplift and emphasize comprehensive reparations. Comprehensive rep reparations recognize that each period of harm cannot be disconnected when seeking repair for injuries on a large scale, especially for state nationwide initiatives. Remember Jim, slavery, Jem Crow, modern day systemic racism. Comparation, uh, comprehensive reparations ooh, also doesn't limit eligibility to the era of enslavement. The comprehensive reparations are about human rights, the right to self-determination, not just old debt. It includes repairing harms caused by governments, repairing harms caused by businesses, religious institutions, academic institutions. Comprehensive reparations also include several eligibility groups for people of African descent based on the three eras of harm. So again, we're saying reparations not just for slavery, it's for multiple errors. It's for Jim Crow and modern day systemic racism as well. So that would include Descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States, Deus. Black communities oppressed by Jim Crow, US apartheid system. Black communities in need of family-based repair, including victims and their descendants of specific historical injustices like Bruce's Beach, Tulsa, Rosewood, Georgetown descendants, black World War II veterans descendants. And black communities oppressed by current day systemic racism that are vestiges of chattel slavery. That would include again, Deus, descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States and some certain black immigrant populations that experience some of the vestiges of slavery during Jim Crow and current day, modern day systemic racism. Eligibility is determined by the harm and the error. The harm isn't limited to slavery. So again, we are connecting the past, present, and the future to get away from that idea that this is about something so long ago that isn't connected to us. So as a reminder, um, we always need to lean back and not try to recreate the wheel. A lot of this work has been done by Encobra and NARC. So uh, this was taken from uh, some older Encobra literature, five forms of injuries 
there's peoplehood, education, health, criminal punishment, wealth, and poverty. That's one of the five injury areas that was laid out by Encobra. And then NARC also has a 10-point plan for reparations. That's a formal apology, uh, a Ma'afa African Holocaust Institu Institute, right to repatriation, right to land and economic development, funds for cooperative enterprises, health, education, affordable housing, strengthening black America's information and communications infrastructure, preserving uh, black sacred sites, repairing the damages of the criminal injustice system. That's all under comprehensive reparations, showcasing we going more, we want more than money. This country got to change, and this world got to change. So again, for the, repara for the reparations communications overview, plan your communications. Because I promise you, the people that don't want you to get reparations, they're planning it. It's one of the things that I have hated forever working in D.C. with different liberal or democratic groups. I would always be fussing in the PR firms and whatever. We're not planning it enough. And they're planning. They got cold words and stuff. They didn't test it with different audiences. They know it sticks. We have to work on that. Plan your communications, get a communications point person or firm if you got the money to, if you don't designate someone in your organization. Plan outreach to your community. Get feedback from your community through surveys. Be strategic with your messaging. It really does matter. Monitor the media and what is being said. Again, sometimes it won't be just right wing. It'll be regular media just getting stuff wrong. And you have an opportunity to, to look up that reporter name find their email, and sometimes it'll be in their Twitter account or on the website, and send them a quick email. Hey, I'm from the task force, blah, 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 blah. You got this wrong. And a lot of times, they will update the article with a comment from the person, from whoever. OK, and again, connect the past, present, and future, correct misinformation, and uplift comprehensive reparations. So I want to leave you with a word from James Baldwin. I know what I'm asking is impossible, but in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand and is, after all, emboldened by the spectacle of human history in general and the American Negro history in particular, for it testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible. They said it was impossible for these Africans to be free. They said it was impossible possible for us to live our own lives and govern ourselves. They said it was impossible for us to get civil rights. They saying it's impossible for us to get reparations. And the, like, like our grandmamas would say, a lie don't care who tell it. So we have to take charge of our communications and messaging and we will do what our ancestors have always done, defeat the impossible. So I want to thank you for listening to me rant about communications. And you can contact me at info at NBCIT.org. We are going to be doing some uh, workshops in January for local reparations movements. So you can get like more detailed digging in on what you may need for communications. Thank you. So just quick question for the audience. How many of you all have had some experience with philanthropy, not necessarily in the field, but you're in a nonprofit, you're an organizer, you're trying to raise money from philanthropy. Okay, that's a good portion of everyone here. And then keep your hand up if you've had at least one experience where you felt like you were demeaned, you weren't treated properly, someone in philanthropy wasn't recognizing of the work and dedication that you've put into the work you're doing. That feels like everyone. And so I just want to acknowledge that up front. Philanthropy is I guess point blank, a pretty messed up institution. There's a lot of people here, so I'm not going to curse. Philanthropy is a messed up institution, and it is based on the accumulation of wealth, of stolen wealth, from black people and indigenous people in this country. So point blank, that's where we're starting from. What LV does as a funder in the movement, or what our optimistic or our vision is for this movement, is that we can return that wealth to the people who are owed that wealth. And at the same time, we're still operating in a system where philanthropy holds a lot of power. And so we're navigating this question of how we move money into this movement in a way that is reparative, 
but also recognizing that we're going to be imperfect in that task. So that's the starting point I just want to start us at. So more to d dive into some of these questions, the first one here, what sources of funding are available to local reparations advocates? So to answer this question, I just want to offer a little bit of a framework for what funding, what types of foundations or institutional philanthropic funding is available. So in our view, we kind of see three primary venues. The first are what we call intermediary foundations. So this is what Liberation Ventures is. This is what decolonizing wealth is, if you know of them or you might be funded by them. These are groups that raise money and then redistribute, redistribute that money to organizations on the ground. And so the way that these organizations, these are different than kind of institutional philanthropies. We don't have a endowment. We don't have money really in the bank. We raise and then redeploy every, essentially everything that, that we raise every year. And so that makes it, the, the benefit of that is that we have more flexibility. We, in kind of being our own organization, we can move money in different ways and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the drawback is, is that we don't have this endowment to rely on. We're not just able to, oh, we can increase the amount of money we're giving this year or spend down an endowment that doesn't really exist. We're raising every dollar we give. Um, this allows us also, though, I think, to be in ideally a little bit closer relationship with groups on the ground. That's why we try to be here and in other spaces. The second type of funding available is through institution. Oh, and I'll just make a note on that. If we don't know you, we want to be in, in, to that point, we want to be in relationship with folks here. So if you don't know us, if we don't know you, please come find me, come find Trevor. Basina, if you can raise your hand. Come find one of us and make sure we get to know you before the end of this conference. We want to talk to you, we want to be in relationship with you no matter if we're able to fund you or not. We hope that we can be in a relationship and support you in some way. The second type of funding that is sometimes available is what we call kind of institutional philanthropy. And so this is what I referenced around having an endowment, a group that has a large money, pot of money sitting and they spend a small percentage of it every year in grant making. This, this type of organization might not be in as deep relationship with the field. But depending on your organization's goals, it might be a valuable source of funding for you. I know that there might be org groups in this, in this room right now that are not looking to access that kind of funding for one reason or another. But if you are, um, just know that that money is starting to become more available. We're seeing groups like the Omidyar Foundation, Fund for Nonviolence, Robert Wood Johnson, cre uh, putting real money into the reparations movement right now, and in some cases even uh, creating kind of repair or even reparations focused grant making areas. And this is a trend we hope to see continue in the movement and are optimistic it will. And so especially with the Omidyar Foundation, would really encourage you all to keep an eye on them. This is an area that they want to be moving into and have a real repair practice area and they might be opening up some real grant making opportunities for local reparations groups. The third type of organization that I just want to uplift is called a local, uh, is just a local community foundation. And we've heard a lot from local community foundations here. Uh, Saul Anderson was here. There are many others here that are funding this event, which I know we are incredibly grateful for. These kinds of organizations within your local community might be a really valuable infrastructure, both to the point of raising small dollars, but then also hosting things like uh, reparation stakeholder authorities or other venues for raising private dollars within the context of your work. And so I just want to uplift them as a potentially really valuable area for local efforts in particular. So that's that quick overview of that. I will also quickly just talk about how funders are thinking about this space. Um, next slide, yeah. So I know that this text is small and I'll try to kind of talk over it. But one thing that LV tries to think about is what the barriers are for funders in funding the reparations movement. And we see kind of a chain of barriers from kind of some of the earlier barriers to some of the later barriers. I'm actually gonna walk from bottom to top. So some of the later barriers, this is a kind of a, a group of funders that might be on board. They're like, I, I'm a program officer, my foundation is like not really sure, but I believe in reparations. So I'm gonna try and make it work within my specific program area or what I have control over. In this context, sometimes we see that funders don't necessarily know, oh, like, I care about this, but I'm not really sure what organizations exist. I'm not super up to date on what's happening in the movement. This is an awesome type of group to work with because in this case, we, there is a real opportunity here to move funders to give this money. If you're in front of a funder like this or if you're noticing that there's a funder in this space, um, this is a 
cool opportunity to talk about how your work in particular uh, fits within an area that that funder is interested in. So for example, we might see funders that are, have a democracy portfolio area. We all in this room know that reparations are fundamental to democracy, but it might be difficult for them to communicate that. So to the extent that you can think about how your work is, core, is tied to a program area of a foundation and communicate that to them, that can be really instrumental in shifting their perspective. And again, as we all know in this room, reparations are fundamental to health in this country. They're fundamental to closing the wealth the wealth gap. They're fundamental to all of these core aspects. And this is how many foundations uh, programs are situated or structured. And so being able to talk in their language can sometimes help move them and help them understand that reparations is core to their work. The kind of second group of funders we see is groups that are kind of in this middle area. They are interested or like kind of open to the idea of giving to reparations, but they don't necessarily know fully how to do it. This is a group where there's a bit more work to do around um, helping them to feel like reparations is not as risky. And that's really kind of an emotional game. And we have a little bit more work that we've done with the bridge band group to try and clarify how funders can move into that space. The last piece I'll just say is that there is this, there's a large group of funders right now who are in this earlier barrier movement. They just don't have an awareness of reparations or don't believe it. And that's the work that all of you are doing to shift them on. As this movement grows, as there's more organizing, as there's more pressure and public pressure, that's what moves funders from those earlier to those later barriers. And so I'll, the last quick point I'll name is just some advice or tips on how folks can fundraise. We can also, we also try to be a resource in this, and so if you have questions about it, please come to us and we'll try to help as best we can. But again, look at the specific funder. If you're in front of a funder and you're um, asking questions about how you can get money from them, really think about their portfolio, who else they're giving to, see where there might be similarities between what you are doing and what they're, what they're already giving to or what their program areas are and how you can communicate about reparations in the context of that portfolio area. The only other piece I'll name is that it can be really helpful. It, we, I know that in the reparations space, there are sometimes terms that we use that might not be as familiar to funders. And so I would really encourage folks to think about if there is specific terminology or jargon that you're using that feels really comfortable and familiar to us, but that might not be familiar to funders, and how you can both to, uh, change the language a little bit to make sure that they are understanding what you're saying, and then also making sure that you can communicate um, how, ooh, lost my train of thought. But <laughs> just the jargon. the jargon, but then also the um, making sure that you feel comfortable communicating the, both the long-term vision of the work that we're doing, but then also the kind of day-to-day -day of your work. Sometimes it can be, easy to say like this is what we're working toward, this is like the vision that we have and this is how all we're doing is gonna work toward that vision. But being able to clearly articulate, you know, like this is in one year what we're doing here, are kind of three main areas of our work, that can be appealing to funders for good and bad reasons. And so that, if those things are helpful, we can also talk, share more, but that is a very high level overview. So on this slide, um, it's, in, it's an imperfect slide, but we hope that it gives kind of just the breadth of work that's happening across the reparations movement. Um, we developed it um, a couple of years ago and have added to it um, as the years have gone by. Um, something that cost, uh, we, we've done two rounds of grant making over the past couple of years, um, getting ready to do our third round. And some of the organizations represented here are movement partners and others um, are not folks who've received funding from LV. And so um, I won't run through them all, but of course there's the local base building organizations. Um, there's the re organizations that provide kind of critical infrastructure, um, capacity building organizations who are kind of the supporters as Jam was mentioning earlier. And then of course we have folks who um, support the movement, but don't receive funding, such as folks like Ta-Nehisi Coast, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who have um, played a critical role in moving this forward. And so um, later this year, uh, or maybe next year, I think we're going to uh, be coming out with a grant-making blueprint, um, which really articulates how we kind of think about the way in which we might move more resources to the field and the different areas um, in which we can do that. Um, and so as Vikas um, we are a grant maker, but we really see ourselves as a field catalyst. And so think about uh, the other 
the other ways in which we can um, support the reparations movement. Um, so our work falls into three buckets, uh, grant making, which Vikas talked about, capacity building, and then narrative change. And so as a director of narrative change, the strategy that we set um, when I first started a couple years ago was to facilitate the growth of narrative power throughout the reparations movement. And we define narrative power as the ability to tell stories that can shift mental models, cultural mindsets, and ultimately culture. And so we think about how can we facilitate the growth of this power. Um, the first way in which we try to do that is um, by trying to build infrastructure throughout the reparations movement, narrative infrastructure. So we launched a program um, two, about a year and a half ago now called the Reparations Narrative Lab. We brought together 13 activists from across the movement, one of which was Kenneth. There's other folks um, who are not here, but um, we came together for ev uh, every month for about a year to, to co-create this narrative framework that we call the Narrative House. Um, the goal of this is to kind of make it easier for folks throughout the racial justice movement to enter the conversation on reparations and then when they enter it, that they enter it in an aligned way. Um, so this is just the general overview. Um, if you go to reparationsnarrativelab.org, you can see the narrative framework in, in, in its totality. Um, we did a whole bunch of other work. We did like message testing, content testing. Um, we did some audience research. Um, but yeah, we really think about the narrative lab as um, a creative, um, and research hub to support the reparations movement. And we are currently thinking about how we can use this narrative house as a tool and starting to think about what um, like a reparations cultural fellowship might look like, where we would kind of gather different artists who would uplift different parts of the, different narratives from the narrative house and try to popular, popularize them throughout culture. Um, and just the last thing that I wanted to note on one of the pieces of research that we kind of like identified in the lab is what we call the hope gap. Um, and I think Jan was talking a little bit about this earlier. Um, so Vikas made this graph actually, and so you can, we, we tracked support for reparations across um, the black community over the past 20 years. Right now it kind of hovers um, in the high 70s. Um, and then that bullet point at the bottom, the data point at the bottom showcases the belief that reparations will happen in this lifetime. So uh, black people, uh, less than 10% of black people believe that reparations is possible. So we call that gap between support and belief um, the hope gap. And what I think this means from a storytelling perspective is that we have to tell more hopeful stories. We have to showcase to folks that reparations, or with black folks, we have to showcase to black folks that reparations are possible because how can we increase support across race um, if we don't believe that it's gonna happen. And so this is just one of the pieces of uh, research that we identified in the lab together um, and just currently thinking about how we can track hope across years and how we can increase hope um, in addition to other things. And so in addition to the grant making, this is some of the other work that we do. I wanna share one more, uh, that reminded me of one more piece of information I wanted to share uh, on the topic of hope. And I hope that this information gives you all some hope. So we did an analysis of every single public opinion poll that has been done on reparations over the last 25 years. And what we found is that in the last 25 years, support for reparations has doubled in the US population from 15% to 30%. That's a huge growth. And that, what that means fundamentally is that the work that everyone here is doing is working. This work is shifting people, it's truly shifting people's hearts and minds. Yes. That, Yeah, it's working. And so I hope that that information gives you hope and that that inspires you to continue doing the incredible work that you're doing. Okay, um, hi, I'm Linda Mann and um, good morning. Good morning. Whoa, I love that. Bring it back. Come on, one more time. Woo, let's go. Okay. Um, I'm going to be very to the point, and I'm going to talk about two things very quickly. Um, so I'm Linda Mann, uh, co-founded the African American Redress Network with Justin in 2019. I'm going to talk about our newest mapping project very briefly, and then I'm going to talk about our community engagement. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, as I said, is this newest mapping. So we started mapping this year, tracking any legislative action in the United States on truth-telling commissions and reparations task force. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of data points. Uh, we started tracking about 147 over the last three years. That's a 
fair number, 147 proposed legislative actions across the United States. Of that 147, 116 were passed. Um, I want to give a shout out to the states that are leading the pack, Massachusetts, Minnesota, California, New Jersey, and North Carolina. Good, good on you. I also want to raise up the work that was done at, by Professor Darren Johnson out of Howard University. They did an inaugural report on transitional justice in the United States. That Mary is really great with the map, and it is embedded on the website. That said, I just want to state that a lot of these legislative actions are passed without funds. How they expect a task force to do a reparations harms report, impact analysis, and a reparations proposal, policy proposal without funds is mind boggling to me. But that's what they're asking. So that's where I want to get into a little bit of the research and the community engagement. We do two things mostly with communities. We do one, we try to pull levers of policy mechanisms to get action. So one of those communities we work with is Brown Grove, and Atanya Lewis, if you please stand up, is here. Couldn't do the work. <laughs> Amazing human, and literally works tirelessly with Renata Harris, who's not here this today, but um, they are a force of action, and we've engaged now with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, and they are actually, we have Region 3, Adam Ortiz, coming to town on January 24th. That's a huge win. They've also agreed to do air testing in the community. This is a community that was settled by freedmen that has been the recipient of environmental injustices over the last 60 years, including two bifurcations by interstate, removal of black land, loss of heritage sites, and complete devastation to their cultural heritage sites, which include African American burial sites and an archaeological site that was a Jim Crow school. So that's one of the things we do. We pull on policy mechanisms to get action. The other thing we do is research. Um, and so I actually want to respond to a couple of things that Guy pointed out that are very important. First of all, if you do not have funds and you find yourself ending up to engage with universities, <laughs> I just want to say we've been thinking about this a lot. And we just came up with a toolkit for universities. This is not for this community, actually. This is, for univer this is a toolkit for universities. If you are going to engage in reparations, framing matters. So how you, how, how universities enter into your community is everything. It is everything. So if you want, if you want, you can contact me. If you want to give this to universities, you say you want to, you want to work with us, this is how you do it. Um, we've framed it in research, which is what universities love. But basically, it's set in very much indigenous practices of deep listening, of coming with cultural humility, of a desired-based research framework that puts the communities at the forefront and puts the um, universities as a learner in the space. You are the knowledge producers, and they are just there to listen and learn and help advance your effort. One. Two, we are trying to increase research to prove not only nationally but internationally that this is a requirement for the United States of America. The one thing that we are really stressing, and I'm going to read an excerpt from a journal article that's coming out on research that we actually did with Bubba Cam, um, that's the student's beloved name for Bubba Cam when we were in Inglewood and West Garfield. I want to give a shout out to some of those organizations that are here. 
We could not believe that the folded map was here. I saw rage is here. These are organizations that, inf that um, informed us on the realities of the communities and the work that needed to be done. So I'm just going to read an excerpt, like I said, from a report that's coming out in the journal of Genocide. Economic genocide, unrecognized by global rights framework as a discrete method to eradicate and destroy groups, has increasingly gained attention as part of a body of scholarship exploring accountability for systemic, systematic, structural harm. As a framework, it contends with the notion that economic, social, and cultural devastation are just as harmful and justified for legal action as violent crime. Further, economic genocide rests on the assumption that systemic economic oppression can create such extreme conditions as to harm whole communities. That is so important that not only the United States, but the international arena recognizes economic genocide because that is basically the underpinning of what has happened in the United States. The disinvestment in the communities from the governments, from the local, state, and federal. Um, in closing, we have used the social determinants of health, which is uh, held up by the World Health Organization. Um, it drove policymakers to take a more holistic approach to healthcare, analyzing how social and economic factor effect, uh, factors affect uh, individuals and communities' overall health. Um, and when you apply that social determinants of health, you can see all of the impacts on the economic stability, the education access, the healthcare access and stability, the neighborhood and built environment, and the social and community context. So as we build a case, I just want to say framing matters. And when you engage with a university, you want to know how they are going to frame the research. And if they are not looking at the overall health of your community, then they are not doing the work that needs to be done. There is not one aspect on the social determinants of health that communities, black communities in this country haven't suffered. With that, we're going to use the social determinants of health this semester, and we're going to partner with the Howard University team on the Black Audit Project, and we're going to roll that up into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we're going to continue to raise awareness, not only in the United States, but internationally. That is going to put a little bit of that public pressure that Guy was talking about to help pass over the finish line. All right, thank, thank you, Linda. I am um, going to speak a bit about uh, the th my theory of the case. So if we're, we're building a case for reparations, um, I'm going to speak from the legal perspective. My name is Justin Hansford, and I'm a law professor at Howard University and also the director of our there are some Howard people in the audience. All right, it's you. Oh no, Hampton. <laughs> say that softly. I heard that. Say, say that softly. Um, <laughs> okay, Clark. Uh, so, what I want to talk about very quickly is uh, my my theory of the case, if you will, if we're building a case for reparations. Uh, one of my heroes, Marcus Garvey famously said that a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. And I want to propose the theory that you, as advocates for local reparations, are those roots, if we look at reparations as the tree that we're seeking to grow nationwide and indeed globally. Because I, I believe that reparations is going to happen from the bottom up. Uh, from a legal perspective, there's a solid case for why that is perhaps the most 
uh, judicious approach as we are crafting reparations remedies that uh, you heard attorney Nick Cummings mention yesterday, remedies that are narrowly tailored to provide remedy for specific harms. It's much more effective to provide those narrow remedies when you have a narrow slice of the black experience that you're looking at. It could be the city that you're in. It could be a particular uh, atrocity that you're addressing. It could be uh, particular claims that focus on families, experiences, or think about the Tulsa race riot. But as, as you are building this case, think of it like this. There's a, a law professor, she's passed away. Her name is Lonnie Guineer. Uh, she came up with this concept called demos prudence. And uh, Shakira is a fan of this concept. So there's this word called jurisprudence in the law, which is the, the collection of case law that helps you understand what the law really is in practice. Then there's the term demos, which is a term which represents the people. And Lonnie Guineer's concept was that oftentimes we think about the laws being made by Congress people or the laws being made by judges, but there's also a phenomenon where laws can be made by the people, where from the grassroots movements that we see happen around the country, there actually can be a new understanding of justice and a new uh, accumulation of knowledge, like Linda talked about, knowledge production that helps us understand what the law is. So you are in the process now of helping the world and the United States judicial system understand what narrow tailoring is when it comes to reparations, commissions, and remedies. Because the truth is we have not had a reparations case go before the United States Supreme Court. And all these people who are telling you that this reparations project is unconstitutional, they're, they're reading the tea leaves, but we haven't had enough case studies to very specifically say that, yes, you can have a reparations remedy that is going to address the systemic harm of housing or education with particular claims that look at not just one case at a time, but perhaps a policy a particular policy that the state of um, Mississippi did in terms of its education policy. So we have not had this case go before the Supreme Court to prove that it would be unconstitutional for us to say that all, all black people in the city, city of Evanston who experienced a, a particular systemic harm over the course of a particular period of years cannot all get reparations on the grounds of race. It would be, under, it would be a, analyzed under strict scrutiny, but we don't know the particular facts yet that would pass strict scrutiny in that instance, and the facts that would not pass strict scrutiny. So in other words, you're providing the raw material. You're providing the uh, roots for the tree of reparations jurisprudence which we have yet to see unfold in a meaningful way in American history. So look at your reparations commissions as that. You're, pro you're providing case studies in the same way that the Evanston process created uh, a blueprint that was used throughout the country. You are creating more blueprints. We went from 50 people at the first conference to I think Robin said 70 at the second over 200 now at the third. So give yourselves a round of applause for that. But we have to think about what, how are we going to get to 2,000? How are we getting to 2,000? And right now what you're doing is you are creating the blueprint for the next 200, for the next 500, because they will be replicating your case studies. Not every city will have a housing report issued by its city that can easily help them replicate Evanston's process. But cities may have an education system or a, uh, another type of system that is similar to yours, and they will be replicating your process in the years to come. So the second point I want to make is, um, as we're trying to create this platform to get from 200 to 2,000, uh, we are proposing 
uh, using a project that Shakira is going to talk about in more depth called the Black Audit Project. This comes out of my work with a group called the United Nations Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. Uh, what this group is, is essentially is a platform at the UN where we talk about issues that affect black people throughout the diaspora. Now one of my mandates, and I'm one of the members of the group that represents uh, the United States in North America and Canada, and one of the mandates of the group is to accumulate disaggregated data on people of African descent. And what that allows us, to, the platform to do, is to figure out what sort of, of atrocities have taken place in the black community in cities across the country that we can report those atrocities to the United Nations using the platform of the UN Permanent Forum, this new platform. So we, we now have a communications avenue to the UN that is direct, more direct than ever before. And uh, there's another law professor named Derek Bell who's, who has a, a philosophy, who had a philosophy called interest convergence, uh, which is similar to what we have been discussing earlier. Uh, this is the understanding that we can use global pressure to promote uh, racial reform in the United States. But this, this global pressure does need a platform. We do need a platform to be able to speak to people around the world in a language they can hear. And people do come to the United Nations. And when they come to the United Nations, they have these discussions on uh, a ground they call the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 goals that countries around the world use to determine the health of their societies. Everything from housing, education, access to clean water, gender justice, 17 of them, right? So what we're doing is we are, and Shakira's gonna talk about this in more depth, but we are applying those 17 metrics to black people in cities across the country. And as we gather that data, we then can make the case for reparations in a more effective way that uses the same metrics as those used by countries around the world so that they can hear us. There's a communication strategy that allows us to communicate with people from around the world. And so we, we believe that by adopting these black audit projects in your cities, you can more effectively make the case for reparations in a way that will resonate all across the world. So Shakira's gonna talk about that in more depth. And again, I'm happy to talk to you more about the legal case for reparations. Uh, one last thing, the Thurgood Marshall Center will be helping to launch a reparations bar association in 2024, reparations bar association. So many of, you, many of you are already involved. If you're not involved yet, please contact us and get involved. We'll be providing uh, training for lawyers across the country who are interested in supporting your reparations commissions. Uh, not every city has a Nick Cummings or an attorney working for the city and there's their city's office that's encouraging of reparations and that knows what they're doing. Uh, most of your cities, I would uh, propose, probably have attorneys that are against the reparations proposal because they think it's gonna be unconstitutional. They don't see the avenue towards constitutionality. So what we're going to be doing is training attorneys from across the country, including law firms, to be able to provide pro bono assistance to reparations campaigns around the country. Uh, we'll be helping to create a, uh, a group of documents, a document bank, so activists can, provide, can, can uh, obtain documents that will help them with their campaigns. And we will create a community of lawyers that will be available on call for people around the country. Problem is, in, ev in every jurisdiction, the lawyer has to be barred in that jurisdiction to work on your case. So that's the problem. That's why I can't do it um, and help everyone everywhere. Or people at Howard can't do it and help everyone everywhere. You have to have a Mississippi lawyer for Mississippi reparations, a North Carolina lawyer for North Carolina reparations. So what we have to do is create a association so that we can train people in every jurisdiction. And that will be happening uh, before May 2024. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hansford uh, d described a little bit of, thank you, 
of the Black Audit Project, uh, the project that I am helping to coordinate. Um, as he said, the, what we do is use the language of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, provided by the United Nations to be able to communicate what's happening locally and specifically in the black community to the United Nations and the rest of the world. And why using this language is uh, so important is because uh, the metric of the uh, sustainable development goals is something that has already been used by countries around the world, uh, cities around the world, and even in the United States, the State Department has already uh, tried to assess the uh, human rights status of the United States. And each state in the union, you can go and look up uh, what the State Department has rated as their human rights status using the Sustainable Development Goals. But what we wanted to know is where our people are uh, using disaggregated data because it is so easy for what is going on in our communities to get lost in the numbers and lost in the averages when we are mixed in with everyone else. And we know that a crisis can be going on in the black community and uh, as long as it does not affect the, the total average of what's going on in the community at large, then that uh, disparity that need goes unseen and it often goes unanswered so what we have been doing is going uh, to many different cities uh, this is the, the uh, presentation that we were able to present in Geneva in de last December uh, the, the first uh, uh, portion of our black audit project where we had a number of cities that we went to that we audited just the black community in uh, those cities and as of now the uh, cities that we have audited and have begun to work on uh, we are up to about 27 different cities and we're not looking just in the United States but at black communities around the world. For example, San Juan, Puerto Rico and also uh, San Paulo, Brazil. So some of the, the things that we do when we come in and we want to do a report, what will end up being a report, but it's also a fact finding and power building with the community. It's an opportunity to talk directly to the, the residents, to the, the people who are working in civil society uh, to tell us what specifically their firsthand experience is in the black community. And even though we look at different metrics, there are a possible 169 different indicators that we could look at that uh, encompass those 17 different uh, sustainable development goals. Um, we also want to make sure that we are including the qualitative data, the stories, what's actually going on from uh, the person who's actually being impacted, the people who's sending their kids to schools in a school district that's had uh, multiple closings, the people trying to get housing in an area experiencing gentrification, and in the past has had people displaced uh, due to urban development and, and highway development. Uh, and a couple of things have started to jump out at us about what's going on in the black community. Uh, first of all, we've learned a, a rising tide does not lift all boats, which we knew that. Uh, but we're seeing in the data how there can be one uh, condition for the city overall and another condition for the black community. For example, uh, in the same years, uh, the city of Pittsburgh uh, was being named the America's most livable city 
based on some data and statistics, when you look at the black community, they were experiencing the worst infant and maternal mortality rates in the country with black women and black infants. So you can see that there are completely different conditions that are going on in the same city, in the same community. Um, we found out how common water crises are. It's not just Flint, it's not just Jackson, but it, it became very shocking that uh, almost every community that we had talked to in that first semester of this project showed that there were points in times where there were toxic uh, uh, water levels in public water and that that's going to have an impact on the health of the black community that the failing infrastructure is starting to hit uh, black communities uh, the hardest and um, that's something we're continuing to find. Um, also, we're, we're, while evaluating uh, different places, we see how some of the, the remedies and um, policies that have been in, put in place have been wholly inadequate for the problem and the disparity created in the black community. Um, one example of that would be the city of Dayton, Ohio, and how uh, one of the um, uh, only trauma uh, centers uh, in a hospital had been decidedly closed. And that left a, a lot of the uh, black residents with uh, without having access to a trauma center so that if you were in an accident and, or had a heart attack, in order to get adequate care, you, instead of a five to 10 minute uh, ambulance ride, now it's a 35 minute uh, ambulance ride. And uh, understandably, you know, cause issues with uh, health. Um, those people uh, found out that their uh, municipality, the remedy was um, a new YMCA center instead of uh, increased medical facilities. But uh, so we really want to be able to go create a snapshot that uh, captures the disparities that are happening in each community. And if you would be interested in, in hosting uh, one of the black audit projects, uh, please seek me out later. Thank you. So it, it's getting lonely up here, uh, but uh, I'm going to take about five minutes to briefly talk about um, Evanston again, but this time in the context of allies. And uh, yesterday, uh, how many of you were in the interfaith clergy session? W one of the questions that came up in the, in the session, and there were five clergy and me, and so I let the clergy answer the question. Uh, was um, what's in the water in Evanston? And, and, and the answer is nothing that isn't in your community, right? And I think that's very important to note because it's not that we did something magical because we're different. We did something magical because we could. Okay, and I think that's really important for you to consider when you look at your own communities. In the case of people who look like me who can support the movement. In your communities, you have many of the components that we have in Evanston. And I think I just want to call them out here. And even if they're not immediately apparent f for, to you, look for them because they're probably there or nearby. A very important part of that is the interfaith community. And there are institutions in almost every city that have a long history of racial justice and a commitment to doing that within their entire congregation. I happen to be a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a lay leader at Beth Emmett Synagogue, which has a long history of it. In fact, um, in 1963, we had Martin Luther King speak um, from our pulpit. And then 60 years later, we had Robin Ruth Simmons speak.
educating people who already believe that there is racial injustice in this country about reparations is not only an easier thing to do, it's also the thing that will build momentum in a community. And so you, I, I, I learned in the years I've been doing this that it doesn't serve for me to talk to people who don't actually believe that the black experience in America isn't the same as the white experience in America. And so I don't bother. I literally self-select them out. And I talk to the people who understand it about why reparations is the next logical step in how to heal our communities. And that's what it's about. It's not just about uplifting black people. It's about healing the communities. In Judaism, there's a concept called tikkun olam, which is uh, what we are expected to do as a people, which means to heal the broken world. That's why I do what I do, and why so many people in Evanston have chosen to do what they do. It also is important to understand that those of us who are allies are not leading the movement. We're supporting the movement. All of you are leading the movement. And what we should be doing is understanding what you need from us and doing that. And that's what I've been very fortunate to be involved in in a number of aspects in Evanston because, as you've already noticed, we have incredible leaders of the movement in Evanston. So the rest of us are there to provide support. And making sure that all the potential allies understand what our role is supposed to be and how we can be helpful without being intrusive and why we're not leading is something all of you can do in your communities. And that's what I wanted to leave you with today because I'd like to catch us up on our meeting. But congratulations to all of you. I've been coming to this for three years and I've watched as the movement has grown in power and in reach, and more importantly, in substance. And the substance is because of all of you. So thank you very much.